thank you for taking the time out to do my podcast. Well, thank you for having me. And it's, it's cool to meet you finally. Yeah, you as well. I hope we can do this uh, on your side of the podcast. I've, I've been oh, listening yeah. to the show. Yeah, you know what? Uh, awesome. Yeah, no, I, I was because you were one of the ones, like I said, I was like, what's up with her? <laughs> and so now we can, it's going to all work out just fine. But it was funny because it's like, it was like literally three days before you hit me up. Oh, weird. Yeah. So it was, it's out there. Perfect and synchronicity. P- yes. Petey says you're a firefighter. I am. Yeah. No way. How long have you been doing that? Uh, six years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I started wrestling when I was, I just turned 18 and yeah. I kind of promised myself, you know, I'll work real hard. I'll grind it out. If I can get signed by a major company, then I'll continue until I'm 25 and then I'll reevaluate my life. Yeah. Uh, 25 came and I had a good run and I was burnt out being on the road full time. And I yeah. kind of did all I could do at that point. Like it was yeah. the divas era was over, but the new influx of the models had come in like the Bellas. Right. And, yeah. and I was just like, Nah. <laughs> yeah, the, be- the I don't the Bellas. Uh, I, I don't don't get me started. <laughs> I mean, that whole era. I just there's n- when they got into the Hall of Fame, I was just I like, for what? For being a fucking Kardashian? Like, Pretty much. That's what you get celebrated for. Yeah, I, I don't know. What, whatever. I mean, I I should. I don't know them personally. And yeah. It's probably better because then I can talk a lot of shit. <laughs> But I hope you just don't air that part. But um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, because uh, one of my best friends is a is a is a captain here. Oh, at one okay. of the one of the houses. So I spend a lot of time at the at the house. So it's like, uh, cool. yeah. So if I find I found that firefighters are a lot. Uh, uh, it, being at a, a station is a lot like being in a backstage. Yes. At a show. Well, it's it's insane. That was kind of the parallels uh, in between my life. Like I've always worked in fields where I'm kind of 20 to one to the guys. And um, it was really, I was not embarrassed, but when I put professional wrestling as my career, when I was uh, applying to be a firefighter, when you're a male, it's fine. It's kind of like cool and bro And a lot of people are wrestling fans, but when you're a female, people think breast implants, nineties porn star. Right. And it's the right. truth. But um and you know, I very well may have looked that way, looked that way, not when I go to work. Um, right. But I wasn't there to defend the person that I am. And right. a right. lot of being a professional wrestler and being on the road and being able to kind of like, you know, be with dudes backstage 24 seven and it being completely platonic and being professional was yeah. very applicable to firefighting. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it's helped me a lot because in Toronto, we have about 200 female firefighters to oh, wow, yeah. 2,800 men. Um, right. But it was a good icebreaker, you know, for the first three years, I think they just referred to me as the wrestler. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps cool. in that aspect. But so where do you live? I live in San Francisco. You live in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. Do the guys yeah. work 24 hour shifts there? Yeah. So, but they don't work that long. They have, I think it's only 10 or it's I think maybe two weeks out of the month okay so because I was going to actually do the training oh but the pandemic hit because he's like just dude because my it's my buddy Dustin he's like just just come and just do this with me and so like that the uh the lieutenant of San Francisco called me up and said hey I heard you're interested in it I was like yeah it's wow he's like okay we'll set it up for you and all that stuff it didn't help that I, you know, play in a band that a lot of people knew about. So it, it helped. It totally but, um, helps. So, and I was going to go do it and then the pandemic hit. Oh, wow. So is that something like, you're going to consider moving forward? Now that I'm uh, pushing 50 and yeah. uh, I'm kind of like, well, I'll be 50 this year. It's something I kind of want to challenge myself to do. For sure. But, you know, it's like, the, as I'm sure you probably know, the older you get, the injuries that you've uh, yeah. uh, collected along the way. Because I had back surgery when I was 29. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So, and I, they had to take out two discs had ruptured. And so they had to basically take them out. So I lost basically like an inch off my height. Oh, wow. That sucks. And then now, like where I'm at, I've got four bulging in the lower 
four bulging in the neck. I got two places where there's no discs. Yeah. And they're just hitting to, and it's bruising. So there's a lot of pain and stuff. Wow. What led up and to the rupturing of discs? I think just being an asshole. Yep. I got that one. <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> you know, jumping around on stage with a 50 pound guitar for an hour and a half yeah. in bad shoes. Yeah. You know, and plus I, I lived pretty hard okay. for, you know, the first sort of till I was about 21, just when oh. I kind of smartened up. Okay. So I kind of, kind of went, went for it. Yep. So I wasn't really taking care of myself, yeah. you know, jumping off of buildings and just doing stupid stuff, running away from cops, just doing things that like, I'm glad my kids don't do. <laughs> do you have you good know. kids? Are they well-behaved? Just you. Well, <laughs> not as you ask that, leave me alone. <laughs> What's that? Don't shh, talk about it another time. But um, yeah, they're good. They're genuinely pretty good kids. My oldest is, his name's Wolfgang. He's 13. He's, he's, he's super smart. Uh, very, very, uh, how would you say it? He's got like a, he can figure things out. Okay. Like puzzles. He's just very uh, attuned. That, okay. He's very, he, like hyper intelligent. Right. And he's kind of the quiet guy that kind of sits back and observes. Whether as my, my youngest he plays drums so he's got that mentality right he just you know wants to whip out his wiener and, <laughs> and and go crazy you know what i mean so and he's he's a lot like me i was so gonna I say so yeah so <laughs> except for i play guitar but um but no but he's and he's very talented as far as like with rhythms and things and uh super smart as well so both i'm, I'm happy to have, and i know they're my kids so it's kind of yeah. like well they're both super smart i mean that's what every parent says but they're actually legit super smart kids they figure they're, they're very wise you know so okay. they very they can figure things out soren i think would be more of like me where we're very emotional ah, so if we get if we if we get hot we get hot right you know what i mean so and if we love you we fucking love you you know, I mean, we want to, we want to snuggle. <laughs> <laughs> I get so, it. I, I like that, but then you yeah. never, I'm a lot like that, to be honest, because I'm like pretty severely introverted. Like I'm, I'm a fake extrovert. Like I can play the game, but really I, right. I just, I have a few people in my life. And if you're in my life and in my inner circle, you're everything to yeah. me. And as a general rule, I don't like people. So. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> what sign are you? Are you a Scorpio by chance? I, I'm an Aquarius. Aquarius, yeah. ah, January baby. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. I'm Virgo. Ah, okay. So I'm a lover. I'm a, <laughs> I'm very I'm very organized, but I got piles all over the house. Okay, organized mess. <laughs> yes. So, but so yeah, how many wives chaos. are you on then? Uh, I'm I just, I'm over two. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Me too. <laughs> me two. too. Oh, with, yes. with husbands, but no wives. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it, that's, that's, it, that's always been a challenging part for me, you know? Yeah, me too. So I think I've always done very well in my professional life and I have a beautiful, healthy, intelligent, psychotic son. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I think I fall in love fast and furiously and I, mm -hmm. I don't look at the bigger picture. So here I am. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I, I feel like every one of those situations because one was only a couple years, mm -hmm. and that was when I was in my twenties. Mm. The second one lasted about fourteen. Oh, okay. And then where the two children came from. Ah. So, but I feel like I'm I'm fortunate and grateful to have gone through those experiences because all the things that I needed to look at about myself, mm -hmm. obviously, there was like herpes. You know, what <laughs> I mean, it's like a you had a flare up, you know what I mean? It's, you're gonna have it forever. Yeah. It's just, you're just having a flare up right now. But I was able to kind of like, not that I have herpes, but. Um, no judgment. No, 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 but I don't. Okay, <laughs> it's not breaking news here. But um, I feel like being able for, for a lot of those character defects and a lot of these things to co have come up for me and then yeah. actually finally go, okay, I'm gonna learn from this one. Yeah. And then to apply it into my other relationships. And I'm like, oh, okay. So the things that I used to trip on, I don't really trip on so much. Okay. So, you know, 
I, I feel like it's a learning experience. I'm grateful yeah. that I was able to, you know, have those experiences, but at the same time, super duper glad to be out of them. Yeah. I like my whole life changed, my whole world opened, you know, I didn't really realize how much of a linear world I was living in oh, until I got out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I'm loyal to a fault, right? So loyalty to me is something that's, it's not like a tattoo. It's not something that like, you know, you put on a t-shirt, mm-hmm. you know, like most kids do. Mm-hmm. Well, not most, but some, <laughs> and um, to me, it's like my moral compass is my moral compass. And, but I also, it's, 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 it's a detriment. It has been a detriment, my loyalty, right. because I've, I've stayed in situations far longer than I should have. And um, I can't say wasted time, but almost like forgot a lot of who I was mm-hmm. as a result. Mm-hmm. and would just stuff it down stuff it down and then what would end up happening is I would just end up blowing up blowing up which is no good for anybody because like I said I'm, I'm kind of a I can be a hothead if I'm not taking care of myself you know Absolutely. well so. that's the the burying and not dealing with shit if you're a busy person like you've been in a band well multiple bands and you have your podcast yeah. and blah, blah blah it's like you don't always have time to look after yourself and do the inner work it's just much easier to push it down and move forward yeah. I'm really well I realized yeah, I mean, I realized though joining 500 bands was also a, a, a sign of like, oh, I'm not that happy. Yeah. So, but I didn't know it. Yeah. Like I was like, oh, I can sprint. I'm going to go join a band that's in England. I'm going to go join a band that's in Germany and then in Phoenix. And then I'm going to have two here. And did you grow up in a household with parents that were, I don't want to say, did you grow up in a traumatizing, like, from my experiences, I always find I pick these relationships because of my upbringing. I have had a lot of like alcoholism and depression in my family. And so I think my tolerance for bullshit is a lot higher than the average person. <laughs> and what I will normalize is not necessarily normal. And once you get out of it, you're like, that's, you know, where that inner work comes in and yeah. like, yeah, well, yeah. sure, the person had a problem, but at the same time, I could yeah. have not stayed. Yes. Well, my upbringing, I can't really say was different from a lot of people. I was a single mom. Mm-hmm. My dad was kind of out of the picture by the time I was three. Oh, wow. And I was, uh, I was an unwanted child for my father. And he, mm-hmm. and he told me a few times, you know, That's but it's horrible. all good. Well, yeah, but what That's else? Fucking you know? horrible. Yeah, it is what it is. Okay. I don't blame him. I don't, it's, it's like what Okay. So my mom was a Danish immigrant. Mm-hmm. So she's straight off. She was when she passed, she just passed in 2020 in October of cancer, but she, she, she battled it three times, third time she lost. I'm so sorry. But no, it's okay. But my, and then, so my mom grew up in Nazi occupied Denmark in World War II. Mm-hmm. So she was like four when it was really going off. Mm -hmm. And so her brothers fought in the resistance and the Germans came and took their house and the whole fucking thing. So she saw, and she saw stuff that I don't really want to get into Mm -hmm. because probably, so when I hear people talk about their fucking trauma, yeah, go fuck yourself. It's like, you know, and I'm not trying to, 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 uh, downplay anybody else's experience but when you're four years old and you're seeing somebody get their head blown off mm-hmm. you know that can probably will shape you 100 <laughs> you, know? you well you're completely desensitized to right well it's not normal to see that that's, right that's the bottom line and that's kind of where my my family's uh my dad's side they're polish so my grandparents were in nazi poland my grandma was sent to uh south africa when she was 14 with her twin sister oh, wow. and you know she never told us anything, but as a woman myself, knowing, you know, being in military, being in, you know, a war-torn country, there was probably a lot of things that happened to the women in that time um, that a blind yeah, eye I would was, say so. <laughs> that a blind eye was turned to. So, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's only just now kind of starting to change, honestly. Yeah. Oh, truly. 
Um, yeah. Like, you know, which my, is, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say myself being a female firefighter, um, you know, it's 2021. I work for the biggest, the third biggest department in North America. And I've had to fight fucking tooth and nail for my place in the department. Like I've got a really good crew, but there's things that are not just, that are not balanced for women. There's a lot of old guys on the job that are soon to retire and they still see it as a job that is not, it's not a place for women. And it's yeah. only because of mentality. Like I had to write all the same aptitude tests. I did all the right. same physical tests. There's no test for women and test for men. I did the right. same interviews and they still choose the top 50 candidates and you only become a gender once you have your interview which is the very last step so it always baffles me when they take that kind of like oh they're just trying to hire visible minorities and um, hire a demographic that reflects that of the city well that's not fucking true because I did all the same tests all the white right. males did and right. I'm here um, but when I was pregnant uh, there was no handbook for pregnant female firefighters. So they, <laughs> that was a real treat. Yeah, yeah, um, I bet. So I helped um, the women on the union develop that book at the time because we have modified duties. But when you're a dude that's twisted his ankle or um, torn his shoulder, your modified duties are, are different than what a female firefighter who's pregnant can do like they want you to go sit in the chief's car going to a fire that's all well and good but you're still sitting in a hot zone where there's like smoke and you know you're exposed right. to toxins so it's right. really hard to be pregnant and be like I would like to fulfill jobs I don't want to just sit on my ass and eat donuts but I yeah. can't be at the fire so yeah 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 it was very yeah, a, relaxing well you know <laughs> <laughs> well here's the here's the plain truth like, and this is what I always, when it uh, always with the gender thing, and it, it doesn't, I don't really swim in any of that, but, and mm -hmm. I don't really, you know, um, you guys make life, you win. So that's kind of where I'm at. You know cool. what I mean? It's kind of like, I can't do that. You can. I like you. So. That's just plain and simple. <laughs> that, you know what, right there. But, like, but that's just, that, but that's just common fucking sense, you know, Whatever, and it's and, common sense. Well, yeah, but I think it's, I think people want, it's so funny because when I was a kid, I didn't want to be labeled. I right. didn't want to have this. I didn't want to have that. And everybody's screaming about, you know, identify me as I want to be identified. And mm -hmm. that's all well and good, but that's not, I don't know. I just feel like I'm a fucking human being. And so are you. And so is that, that, that person. And it doesn't. So to me, like the color and all that stuff and creed and who, which God you play yeah. pray to or who you want to fuck or whatever i don't care it's none of my business it doesn't really matter to me like that's not i don't i don't think that's what makes makes you are who you are i agree you know and i think that when my mom and being raised by her and, and you know denmark's very liberal yeah and but she always taught us to kind of judge people on their merit you know so and where we lived was very multicultural. There was blacks, there was Mexicans, there was Vietnamese, there was us. I mean, we were the only one of the only white families because we were as low income housing. Okay. So there was the Baileys and they were Irish, Irish Catholic. So there was like 40 of them because they breed like rabbits <laughs> and <laughs> no birth control. So they don't believe in it. Right. Same. So, you know, the thing for me was it was, I kind of feel like even though we were all poor, it was a level playing field. So, you know, it, it wasn't, it was kind of a, a really, you know, I didn't, until I got out of it, I didn't really kind of look back and go, fuck, that was fucked up. Yeah. You know, it just was my existence. But when I think about it, like, those experiences shaped, obviously, how I think, how I act in the world. Mm -hmm. But the challenging part, becoming like a father now, is like reminding myself that my kids' experience is not going to be anywhere near my experience. Right. So I can't parent from a place of like, if this, like my youngest is 13. And when I was 11, I went to juvenile hall for the first time. Wow. So he hasn't done that yet so i already win you get what i'm saying <laughs> yeah I so 
<laughs> he's just playing video games and hanging out with his homies and yeah. that's cool and he you know plays guitar and you know does his thing and that's totally fine so I feel like you know because as a parent and as I'm sure you could relate you want your children to do way better than you it's all you want and, ha and have a better life yeah and then they live in a nice house and, and you know in a good city and go to a nice school mm -hmm. and that was you know as a result of like years and years and years and years of touring but you know not that i did do it alone yeah because you know obviously their mother works and has a job and provi help, provides for them as well mm -hmm. so but uh they're not gonna have my experience and right. so to parent i don't no one gave me a a book and said well this is how you do it now nobody gives anybody a book right mm -hmm. so you kind of just fly by the seat of your pants a lot of the times and uh to get them to brush their teeth is a fucking chore <laughs> it's an argument it's like it's like fucking what are you a lawyer now it's like chill you said they're you know, smart you, yeah but i'm the fucking judge <laughs> yeah i'm i got the final ruling you know my word, word is law it's so not it's fun like, unless they test you though i know my three-year-old is straight into the whys it's like i don't know he woke up about two months ago and anything i say why but why mommy why <laughs> why and i love him but he is my karma he never shuts yeah. the fuck up he never stops talking he's up at 7 30 in the morning and he is still talking when it's bedtime at 7 30 at night i can hear him in his room like la, 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 la. and i'm just like <laughs> yeah. i love him but you pay for it and i don't know if you felt this way but i truly understood my parents a lot better when i became a parent i called my mom a few times <laughs> and just said you were right i'm so sorry I fucking broke that lamp that I blamed on the cat. That was me. <laughs> you know, I always knew that last, you know what I mean? But, you know, you're finally copping to it, being accountable. Yeah. But, you know, the, the good thing is, is that I didn't really have much of a childhood. So mm. having these guys has really kind of made me relive it. That's cool. So I feel that way through, too. you know, like taking them to go see pro wrestling, for instance. Yeah. You know? Like that wasn't, a, you know, always an opportunity for me. Right. So I have, would have to go make my own way to get to see shows, music shows, you know, any kind of entertainment that was always on me. Like nobody like grabbed my hand and said, come on, let's go. Mm -hmm. You know, a few people did from time to time, but, uh, but nobody was into pro wrestling like I was. Nobody was really into music like I was or right. the music that I was into. There was only a certain like my brother and a few of his older friends. So here I was like this 11 year old, 11 year old kid hanging out with kids four, five, six years older than me, yeah. who are obviously doing things that five or six years older than me would do. And I gotta right. be careful what I say, because <laughs> I got big ears over here. Yeah. And so then I was kind of, that was kind of the pathway for me to kind of start experimenting with those types of things. Right. And with that, for me, like came a lot of trouble, uh, so a lot of mountains to climb, you know? So, and it became a uh, situation for me where it's like, that's all I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then kind of got an opportunity to, to not do that. So I decided to go that route. And then I, when I started really doing the band thing, it's funny because all of that energy that was going into, you know, mind altering, uh was going now going into this and then all of a sudden it was like oh you know so so it kind of worked out was music your savior then uh, you know as cliche as it fucking is it's like it's yes for sure i remember one time it's so funny and i always think about that question because there's a soccer player by the name of peter crouch mm -hmm. and he played, oh, I know. played for big gangly yeah. dude yep yeah and I was watching an interview with him one time because he's not, he's not like the best looking guy. Right. I know. And, the, and the guy says to him, it, uh, Peter, if you weren't a professional footballer, what would you be? And he just looked at the guy and he goes, a virgin. <laughs> and I just thought that was the most amazing answer in the world. 
because of how self-conscious, you know, I mean, and self-deprecating it too, but just that he knows I'm this gangly seven foot eight weird guy with buck teeth and, you know, the whole thing. But I, you know what, I'm a fucking professional footballer. And, but so I always think about that question, but yes, uh, music definitely saved where I, where I would probably be now yeah. for sure. I ask because I answer the, that question in the same begrudging way. It's like, yeah, fucking wrestling saved me because I could have gone in a very different direction, but you put all that energy and that creativity into something you love and you're passionate about. And it's, yep. it, it really is a game changer. And for sure. I just, to segue, you, you said a quote, something to the effect of uh, the connection between musicians and wrestlers and we're all the same misfits. And like that to me, it, you know, like every wrestler that I've worked with that I haven't met that I've maybe met on my podcast because I was inactive for 10 years, you're best friends within 15 minutes of talking because you are the same total weirdos. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. We're we're egomaniacs with inferiority complexes. Yeah. All of us. For sure. So I mean, you if you're gonna go out and perform, you, you there's something a little off here. Yeah. To go out and do something that people are going to scrutinize and judge no matter what, no matter how fucking great you are. Yeah. But I think the performance that like what drew me to it, my my so when I first saw professional wrestling was a friend of mine, he was from Detroit, Michigan. So mm -hmm. he used to go to Cobo Hall and see the Sheik and stuff. And he was a lot older than us, this guy, mm -hmm. Andy. And one day, Saturday morning, I was, I went over to his house for some reason, because he lived next door to this guy, Sean Gregonis, who was like the punk rocker, you know, okay. like that's where we would meet up. And Andy was cool. And he's watching pro wrestling. And I remember sitting down and watching it. And I think it was like, uh, it might have been some um, LA, it might have been um, uh, a big time wrestling. So that would have been LA or San Francisco. Okay. I forget the promoter. I used to know that, but, I, you know. <laughs> but anyways, and it was like, and I think the, on the show, I remember Pat Patterson. Mm -hmm. I remember Rowdy Piper. Wow. So this might have been 80, 81, something yep. like that, maybe 82. So, anyways, long story short, I was glued. I was just like, whoa. And uh, every Saturday I could, I watched wrestling from then on. And the good thing, and this is before cable TV, right? Mm -hmm. So once cable TV came in and you got the super station in like 85, 86 or whatever, every Saturday was like, you wake up, I think it was uh, um, uh, USA Wrestling. Um, it was WWF yeah, and then you had glow and then you had obviously NWA. And then in the evening you could, I would get Polynesian Pacific championship wrestling. Wow. I think it was like seven o'clock on UHF. And so you see high chief Peter Maivia, Lars Anderson. I was so stoked when I saw a guy with my name <laughs> and, uh, I think they were battling out for the championship at the time. I don't know. And then at night, then you'd get Bill Watts, mm. the UWF, and they'd always leave you on a cliffhanger. And it would end right about one in the morning. So it started at midnight. And then yeah. during the summertime, it'd be so hot and you couldn't sleep anyways. And you just have the lights on, drinking iced tea, watching pro wrestling. And, it, and you know, I was got into punk by then. So a lot of the kids didn't want you know like their parents would and i had gone i had gotten in trouble so a lot of my friends or my peer group their parents would wouldn't let me hang out with them or them hang out with me you so for kid. me i was yes yeah. but i was actually a really good kid i just of made course. some mistakes of you course know? i get it and i should have seen at 11 you know uh that maybe i had a, a potential problem mm -hmm. And, but you know, I was 11 and it gives a shit. So, but I wasn't playing, yes, I wasn't playing with matchbox cars or uh, baseball cards. I was listening to Discharge thinking that the world was going to end in 1984 <laughs> or Crucifix, you know? <laughs> and I was, you know, socially conscious about like what was happening with, you know, I mean, the first punk shows were in gay clubs. So you knew about the gay scene. Uh, you know, all my friends were either black, Hispanic or Vietnamese or whatever. So, there wasn't really that there. Right. I don't really truly think I saw like 
what the world was really like yeah. until I kind of went out of my neighborhood. And I kind of started to see like mm -hmm. these things like race, racism and sexism and, you know, and which everybody, which every single human being has had scuffs with, you know, yeah. in their lives. But so I didn't really kind of start seeing all that. So I went in and how I went in was pro wrestling was kind of like my mom and dad in a lot of ways, like the Ramones were or GDH or the business. Wrestling was like, you know, something, you know, to watch on TV. Ric Flair coming up and doing promos, Dusty Rhodes, Manny Fernandez. I wasn't really a Hulk Hogan guy. I was like more of the, the heels. Yeah. Um, wasn't really an ultimate warrior guy either. I always liked the heels. I always liked the, you know, million dollar man. Oh and, yeah. You know, I always like, you know, that kind of Kamala. <laughs> him. Kamala. Hey, didn't, wasn't really a big boss man fan. I, I remember him when he was, uh, was it big Bubba? Wasn't he yep. big Bubba? Yeah. Yep. And then, uh, love the midnight express, love Jim Cornette. <laughs> Jim Cornette, you know, I, when I finally got a chance to meet him was when ROH was running a show. It was, a, I guess is when WrestleMania was in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so ROH was running the old uh, uh, spot where the WC, WCW Saturday night was. I forget the name of the place. But, and I was with Punk because Punk was still wrestling at the time. Mm -hmm. And we went to this, like, it was like a fan fest. And I met Jim Cornette. We hit it off. And I was just like, you know, he was such an easy guy to talk to. Yeah. And of course, you know, he's a wrestling super brain. He's like yeah. the super computer. And um, we were just talking and talking and talking and, and hit it off. And it was just so cool that he was such a regular guy, but like most guys were, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, you know, even I, I hated Shawn Michaels, <laughs> fucking hated that guy. <laughs> but when I met him and did some time with them, super probably the cool one of the coolest dudes i've ever met in my life really you know yeah super nice to me we, i mean i was in the back arn anderson's fucking there just kind of with his solo cup just <laughs> won't say hi to me you know he's fucking and then finally like uh we go it was punk won the the the, the ic belt from regal mm -hmm. and it was at a, on a monday night raw so i did the loop with him and kofi and uh Punk wants to throw a little party. So we go to this place called Gio, Gio, Giordano's. It's like a deep dish spot. Okay. Arn comes and he finally comes up to me and we start talking. And uh, so, and I'm singing, it, like he asked me to sing a song and I'm like fucking Arn Anderson's <laughs> asking me to sing a song, like just acapella. So I start doing Roots Radicals to him and he's like tapping his foot. And he's like, all right. And then we became friends. And I was like, fuck, I'm hanging out with one of the four horsemen. You know what I mean? That's so and, funny. One time in Japan, me and Flair were next door neighbors. We were at the same hotel. Yeah. And we always run out of, run into each other, like coming in and out of the, for whatever reason, his <laughs> lobby call and my lobby call were the same. And he's super gracious, nice guy. And I'm just like, fuck, it's Ric Flair, you know? So these are the guys that like, you know, when we played Madison Square Garden, it wasn't, I wasn't stoked because, you know, Kiss played there or whatever. I was stoked because that's where Snuka did the, you know top rope That's so top, up top of the cage you know on the morocco because i saw that you know and that was like visually like so stimulating to me like that's what i wanted to do you know was was and so it's funny because my the drummer of of rancid he goes lars you know you're not like a, uh you're not like a punk rocker i'm like what do you mean he goes you're like a pro wrestler trapped in a punk rocker's body <laughs> you know and i was like all right, but, and then, but literally everything, all my stage banter, all that stuff yeah. uh, comes, that confidence comes from watching Dusty Rhodes cut a promo or Michael Hayes cut a promo or, you know, the list goes on at, at infinitum. But I mean, I feel like I got all of my, uh, all of my shtick as a performer, not yeah. from other musicians, but from pro wrestlers. I mean, and that's just to be brutally honest, but that's how much I love because yeah. it gave me a comfort at a time where number one, I desperately needed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody was really available to do that. But for whatever reason, those TV shows made me feel like everything was going to be okay. Yeah. You know, cause I could get wrapped up in why the fuck is baby doll turning on, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 yeah. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, like, you know, Magnum TA, fucking, you know, why? And my mom would go, why do they call him Magnum TA? I go, I think it's his mustache, you know what I mean? It's mullet <laughs> shit. And I'm, you know, just like the whole thing, you know, where, you know, Four Horsemen beat up Dusty Rhodes to break his leg. And just like, there's so many class. That's that whole era, that 80s NWA era. Because I mean, a lot of times I'd find out about the Sheep Herders or, you know, Junkyard Dog or DiBiase and that you'd buy the wrestling magazines. Yeah. Because we didn't have the TV. Okay. So, but you'd have the wrestling magazine. You had Inside Wrestling, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, obviously. Yeah. And so that's how I would get a lot of my information. So I, I would, and I would read it. You know, like just, it was my thing. And I had like my bedroom had pro wrestlers. It'd be like Abdullah Butcher, like just, you know, crimson mask. And it's like <laughs> on my ceiling. Like I'm throwing a beat to, no, I'm sorry. No, no. Inappropriate. Ah. No, but no, 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 no. But it, it's, uh, my point is, is that they were everywhere. I got you. They were everywhere. <laughs> well, <laughs> as such a wrestling encyclopedia like you're a passionate wrestling fan doesn't even scratch the surface of what you are you've seen the whole evolution of women's wrestling um yes. and it, it's definitely ebbed and flowed but over the past 10 years there's been a huge change to not only like the physical appearance of female wrestlers but yes. what women can actually do in the ring which we've always been able to do we just didn't always have a platform to do so who are your favorite women wrestlers? And I mean, like from the beginning of time till now. I love the three. first three. Yeah. Well, I would have to give you a tag team, which was the Jumping Bomb Angels. Ah, yes. Okay. They changed women's wrestling, I'd say, where they, they started I would, it. Yeah, I mean, that was some real shit. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is tough. This is like, you know, three top favorite bands um well you can you can elaborate i don't want to i don't want to uh i loved um i really loved moolah honestly i'm i know that they're both of what's the not ladies. to love <laughs> well to me she was she just went in there and she just handled business yeah it was like an angry lion <laughs> and it, you know and i mean and as you said like you know the way that they got sort of scoped, you know, was this, you know, more about tits and ass yep. and like fashion models or um, what do they call them? Uh, like yoga athletes or whatever. Yeah. And then they throw some tits on them and then say they're a wrestler. And it's yeah. like, no, but, and, um, but um, Ruby Riot yep. is definitely, I think, one of the best. I love the women's stuff now just because it's actually like, it's actually taken serious. Yes. And sometimes it's, and not to put it in a gender thing, but I'm going to, cause I'm a fucking wrestling fan, but sometimes it's more entertaining than the men's shit. Right. For sure. And, and you can tell who's been trained by who, and you can see like who's been through William Regal's hands or Fit yeah. Finley's, you know, or a, a, a host of others. So, and the more and more that, you know, because I am such a wrestling nerd, I would look into the background, who, who trained them or who, yeah. and then you kind of start to see the styles. Like yeah. for you, for instance, like, it's not like you go in there like, ah, <laughs> you, know, you're, you go in there like, let's go. Yeah. Right. So, and that's what attracts me to a female wrestler. It's not necessarily her looks. Right. It's, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a man. Okay. I get, you know, I know what a, an attractive female looks like, but my point is, it's like, it's not just that for me. It's not just like, wow, I want to fuck her. It's not about that. It's like, yeah. it's more or less about like, you know, what is she doing in there? What's her mechanic? Jordan Grace is another one. Yeah. Badass. She brings the intensity. For sure. You know, and there's so many, and I think, and I love the fact that they look like women. Yes. You know, it's not like this yeah. plastic, I don't, I've never was into that anyways. Yeah. Like, you know, um, it's not really my trip. You know, I, I like a la natural. And, and I want a little, you know, chunk, chunk on the bump. You know okay. what I mean? It's like, you know I mean? That's like, you know, you can't, I'm not intimidated by that. On, you know, whatever. Put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>